occasion of our Juneteenth celebration. Juneteenth commemorates June 19, 1865, the date Union soldiers informed black slaves in Galveston, Texas, that they were free. More than two years after the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation had been signed on January 1st, 1867 by Abraham Lincoln. Also known as Freedom Day, Black Fourth of July, Jubilee Day, and Celebration Day. Juneteenth was first celebrated in 1866 and is the oldest commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. Today, we recognize the perseverance, determination, and sacrifice it took to achieve emancipation. The slave food team has committed ourselves to providing people with the information that they would need to make better choices regarding their health, which is a form of institutional and systematic oppression when continuing to keep us sick. The slave food presentation is the brainchild of Dr. Columbus Batiste and Dr. Eric Walsh, graduates of Oakwood University. Dr. Batiste is a board certified cardiologist and chief of cardiology in Southern California. Dr. Batiste's mission is to share information so that each one can teach one about the benefits of plant-based nutrition, daily exercise, and stress reduction. This mission has led to the formation of a nonprofit organization called the Healthy Heart Nation, which provides education through lectures, newsletters, social, and digital media. Dr. Eric Walsh was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He is a graduate of the University of Miami School of Medicine, Loma Linda University School of Public Health, where he received both his, both his master's and doctorate in public health. Dr. Walsh has embarked on his own plant-based journey and as a result has lost more than 70 pounds by adopting this lifestyle. Dr. Walsh has committed his life to speaking around the globe through his preaching and healing ministries. We again thank you for joining the Slave Food webinar in celebration of Juneteenth, and we invite you to listen and enjoy. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We want to welcome you guys to this Juneteenth celebration. It's such an honor and a privilege to have you joined with us uh, today. And I'm going to turn the reins over to my colleague. And we're going to, this is going to be a unique, uniquely different type of presentation as we, we give a dual presentation. We go back and forth. So we hope you enjoy. We hope you learn. We hope you're uh, inspired as we move forward. Yes. One of the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Good, no, go ahead, Eric. I was just going to say thanks. I want to thank everybody and um, make sure that they um, got a good um, introduction to Dr. Batiste, who's become one of the premier African-American physicians in the country, really moving people towards a plant-based diet. Um, he's a cardiologist and makes his money the opposite way <laughs> um, in, in terms of doing procedures and hospital-based things, but really um, wonderful to be a part of the team where he's really pushing to get people to live healthy through a plant-based diet. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and I too, I'm, I'm honored, I'm actually humbled. So I met Eric way back when we were students at Oakwood University. Uh, we, our friendship kind of really grew, took off when we were inside of med, when I was in med school. And uh, everything kind of came back full circle a bit later on, and I'll share that with you. But he's just a phenomenal speaker. I'm, I'm always in awe when I listen to him. It's one of those things like the NBA players will say, listen, I love to watch such and such play ball. I love to listen to Dr. Eric Walsh when he speaks. So it's quite an honor. But we're going to jump into this. And so let's go ahead and, and get you all fed this evening. All right. We are um, going to start by just saying that with a lot of what the discussion about um, race and um, health disparities that have happened in the last three months, before um, any of um, the protests around the unjust um, killings of African-Americans that happened. Uh, we were talking about the health disparities related to the coronavirus. 
Um, and one of the things I think that is important is to look at the length of time uh, to which African Americans have been in this country. Uh, we often start in the early 1600s, but it goes as far back as 1526 when a group of slaves were brought by Spaniards um, to the Carolinas, eventually um, actually escaped. There were about 100 of them. Um, and so this is the history. And one of the reasons we put this down, we'll, 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 we'll kind of um, jump back to this a little later on. This speaks to the amount of um, time that really freedom has been granted, at least legal freedom has been granted uh, to African Americans in the United States. And it speaks to something, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick this up again later, but it speaks to one of the things that um, is relevant to the health disparities that are affecting African Americans. One of the things that we, that we see, go ahead, Eric, in terms of Juneteenth. So and Juneteenth, of course, is um, that time when, as we just discussed, um, a group of slaves who had no idea that legally they were liberated found out they were. Um, and I think one of the reasons Juneteenth lingers as a special day for African Americans is because uh, in some ways we're still not free. Um, it's as if the legal description of freedom has been given to us in many ways, but um, you know, in, in many other ways, um, in terms of health disparities, uh, incarceration rates, um, wealth, um, there's still a huge difference. Uh, Juneteenth now, to me, symbolizes us moving forward and how we, we, we uh, actually correct things uh, going in the other direction. So it's a very special day, and one of the reasons why we chose this day to start this project online uh, to share with everyone. You know, and one of the interesting things is that when, it, when we first came together, it was right around Juneteenth, about four years ago. Now, the, the, the most interesting part of the story is that there was an individual who was out visiting in California that we were classmates with, Joe McKenzie from Oakwood University. And on that time, my wife decided to go ahead and cook a spread out there for us. And we had everyone around the table. Eric was there. I was there. We had doctors and we had lawyers. We had uh, health professionals. We had teachers and, and business persons that were all there. We were having a good time reminiscing over our days at this historically black college and university. And all of a sudden, our, our, our friend, who's a lawyer, he said, I got a question for you docs out there. He said, what is the deal with black people? We all kind of stopped and we looked at him and said, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, I'm in my practice and I have Jewish colleagues and Caucasian colleagues and various ones that are there. And I, when I go to the doctor, they tell me I need to have a prostate checked. I have to have a colonoscopy because I'm at, great, I'm at risk. And I go back and I talk to my colleagues and they say, I don't have to have any of that stuff done. And he was like, what's the deal with that? Now, the funny part was, is that right around that time, I too was asked by a colleague sitting inside the chief's meeting and he said, Batiste, what's the deal with black people? Why is it, man, that you guys get everything? You get diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all these things more. And this was really the premise that Dr. Walsh and I started out on is why is it that black people in America die sicker and sooner than other people? So one of the things we discovered um, years back when I was working in public health, um, one of the things that fascinated me is that there is a, a geographic connection between life expectancy um, and groups of people. So we always start with this one in Washington, D.C. And if you started out at the Capitol Heights train station and went all the way out into Maryland um, uh, on the train, uh, for every mile and a half you travel, life expectancy decreases by about a year. And you can see when you look at this, that if you look at it, um, you know, it, it, when you get all the way out into Maryland, it's 81.3 years. Uh, for 30 miles, it's a nine year life uh, span disparity if you look at the 72 year life expectancy inside the city. And, and what, what's interesting is it's, you should never have to worry um, that, that, um, that your life expectancy is tied to, to your geography. And that's what you can see here. Um, for this first one, that's Capitol Heights. The next one will show you um, what it looks like um, when you go out to, the, to, to, out to Maryland. Um, and you can see out here at the Shady Grove Station, there's a, there's a, you know, this study was like 20 years difference at the time when this one was done. The point is, you're, you know, 
our zip code shouldn't be what determines life expectancy, but in America it is. Um, often more so your zip code than your genetic code. Um, and so part of what we're looking at is how do we match this? And what we found is that if you go around the country, you find the same thing. This is Atlanta and you can see 84 years life expectancy at the top of this map um, and as low as 71 years um, in the Southwest portion. Um, 13 year difference, just, just in Atlanta. And that's huge, um, obviously, um, as, as an average life expectancy difference. Detroit, similar. Um, 69 years in one zip code um, and all the way out to 82 years in another one. Um, and as we go through these cities, Chicago uh, has a huge 85 years compared to 69 years. I think this one is the largest gap um, that you that you can find, 16 years. Yes. Um, and of course, Jersey um, here is uh, New Jersey near the capital. Um, and you can see again, 87 years when you go way out um and 73 years inside the city um so these disparities exist and they're real they're very real philly man suffers the worst that's a 20 year difference if you look at the description of driving based on your zip code just in that short amount of time that's powerful your zip code should not determine your longevity at all you know what we see is that this is not something that's just unique we're seeing that we lead out really inside this disease burden across the board that African Americans seem to die sicker and sooner than everyone else. We're seeing that 50% are more likely to have heart disease, but here's the thing, African American men are twice as likely to die of heart disease than Caucasian men. African American women are three times as likely to die of heart disease compared to Caucasian women. We know that in individuals who suffer with high blood pressure, if you're African American, you're more likely to be diagnosed with high blood pressure, but you're less likely to have your be treated well, right? You're less likely to have your blood pressure optimized. So that means you know about it, but either you choose not to be on meds, you know about it and you're on meds, but they are not optimal, or you know about it and you're on meds. Uh, so there's, there's a problem. And we're seeing that this is prevalent at every age, you're more likely to die sicker and sooner across the board in the 20s to 30s. 30s to 40s, 40s to 50s, and 60s and above is what we see. And then into the coronavirus. Um, this, um, we heard outrage across the country as we started to realize that African Americans um, were being disproportionately affected by the virus um, and disproportionately dying from the virus. Um, but the truth of the matter is, Nothing we saw with the coronavirus didn't exist in a sense in the health disparities that predisposed individuals to these um, to, to, to significant illness or death from this virus. And um, we've seen um, here, um, as you look at um, actuarial charts, um, you can look at from state to state, um, these differences um, have existed for a long time um, in how African Americans die early from uh, treatable conditions. Um, and it goes across the board um, in the United States of America. Yeah, so I mean, every state we see this, I mean, a treatable condition, we know that preventable diseases are prevalent. And that means blood pressure, that means cholesterol, that means diabetes, these things are treatable. And so we're saying that we die, we're more likely to die from all of these treatable, preventable, style diseases across the board. So when we, we put, a, we put some studies together, we, we, we've, been, we've been showing this uh, for a while and it just shows that back in 1990, Otten and his group of researchers um, showed um, that the, the, the reported death rates were per 100,000 for people. Remember this is for people 35 to 54 years of age. Um, it was 2.3 times higher for African-Americans. They adjusted for six risk factors. A lot of people would say all of these reasons are why uh, blacks would die sooner. Smoking, high blood pressure, cholesterol, excess weight, alcohol, diabetes. But when you even adjusted for all of those three things, it decreased from 2.3 times down to 1.9 times. So it was still a huge difference, twice basically. They added income because people say, well, it's because black people are poor. But even when you adjust for income, it's 1.4 times. And that leaves about a third of the difference unexplained. Yeah. So we actually look at um, the death rates for um, 
high earners, um, people who, you know, we, we have I images here of celebrities and um, Bernard Tyson who's a great a leader in uh, healthcare. And you can look at this and see, uh, even when people have resources, African Americans have healthcare resources, we still die sooner. So poverty controlled for still leaves an excess of 38,000 deaths per year or 1.1 million years of life lost among African Americans in the United States. So, you know, the, that's really the question. Basically, the question is, what do these racial disparities in health really mean? What does it mean? I mean, obviously, on the personal level, seeing one of our loved ones pass away sooner is, is traumatic and it's devastating. But what does it mean in terms of day to day? It means it's just comparable. The work that's been done by many great authors out there and so forth have shown that it's comparable to like a plane crashing every day. 265 deaths every year is what the health disparities mean. What it means is that every seven minutes, in some estimates, a Black person in America dies because of a preventable disease, because of a premature death. What it means is that this issue of health matters, of Black Lives Matter, is not something that pertains just to Black people. It's an American issue. And so when we look at the healthcare crises in America, one of the things that we understand is we understand that these racial health disparities result in astronomical economic losses. We're seeing a 10, $35 billion increase in excess healthcare expenditures, a 10 billion increase in, in lost productivity, and a 200 billion in premature deaths. Now, on a simple level, what this means to a young family that whether or not they're because of incarceration issues and, and, and putting us there, but with death from preventable causes, if you lose a, 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 an earner, income earner, that devastates the financial structure of a family. And it ruins it and it creates a legacy that's a downward spiral. And that's where there's huge issues as it relates to this. So the question really arises once again, why do Black people in America die sicker and sooner than other people? And the answer um, that we have found in our research and in looking at this is that what separates African Americans um, in a many of, in, the, in, the, in this death rate question is stress. Um, and we're going to talk about stress for a little while and show that, in fact, it is what is uniquely um, attributable to, to this situation. So stress, we have a definition of stress here. Stress is a condition or a feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. That's stress. We break this down into an equation, which is the stress equals demands minus resources. And here's what you have to get. Um, the more resources you have, the more you're able to mitigate stress. Um, and the more demands placed on you, the worse your stress is going to be. So African-Americans often don't have as many resources. And here's the thing, even if you're wealthy, you often don't have the same amount of resources and often have uh, some unique demands placed on you. And so when you have this chronic stress, it puts you into a, uh, a continual state of fight or flight. I always, I, when we do these presentations, I, I make the joke about being chased by dogs in people's backyards in, um, in Hartford when I go visit, visit my grandparents. Um, and you know, you see that dog, I mean, and all of a sudden your adrenaline gets pumped, your cortisol gets pumped, your, your, your blood pressure goes up, you need to get blood to your brain, your heart rate increases, your, your respiratory rate increases, blood is shunted away from your, um, your digestive tract to your muscles, um, your liver starts to make sugar through gluconeogenesis, um, you, you, you massive releases of insulin to get sugar into, into your muscles. And so all of these things happen. But if, they, if, if every day it's the equivalent that you're being chased by a dog, if you're constantly stressed, all of those normal physiological, really allostatic is the technical term, changes, what it eventually happens is they begin to, they go from being allostatic um, uh, and to eventually causing disease themselves. Um, and that really is the problem. Allostasis will cause disease. And so um, this is where you start to become more prone to getting high blood pressure and diabetes and other things because you are in a constant state of stress. And when you eat bad foods, it actually makes the bad food even worse for you. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's one of the things I oftentimes tell patients is that, and I think you mentioned it, it's like when you're stressed, your pupils change. When you're stressed, your blood vessels actually crimp down to force the blood, the, the blood through the vessels more vigorously, creating a hypertensive state. 
right? Your blood, your, your liver and the pancreas begin to mobilize the, the, the glucose, allowing the, uh, a pseudo-diabetic state. And those are the components that you're really kind of speaking to that are there. So chronic exposure to stress, poor social supports, and limited social networks have been shown to increase disease risk. Um, so these, this makes sense. All of these things are, exist in our communities in many ways, um, regardless of how much money you make. You can be quite lonely on a job as the only black professional or the only black student in the class. Low perceived control is a determinant of heightened stress response and poor adaptation. So if you feel like you don't have a whole lot of control over your life, you'll also have lots and lots and lots of stress. And then adversity and feeling vulnerable, along with psychological markers such as low self-esteem and loneliness, are also associated with poor health outcomes. And I want you guys to get this. In a situation in a society where you are constantly being told that your kinky hair is not beautiful, your wide nose is not beautiful, your dark skin is not beautiful, um, when you're constantly being given examples of beauty that don't look like you, as has happened ever since 1526, what happens is you ha your own self-esteem is impacted and it decreases. Um, and this alone will constantly increase your stress when you inherently think, you're not attractive, you're not beautiful. Um, and so this is, again, a unique stressor for African-Americans being uh, Black in this country. Yeah, yeah. You know, Eric, you, you always tell the story during our, our talks live in person about your own personal experience with that. You want to share with them about that? Yeah, one of the stories I always tell is that I had a, a relative who basically... Um, who, who uh, said to me once, you know, I was, I was in the kitchen getting something when I was like 15 years of age. Um, and she said, you know, you would be so handsome if you weren't so dark. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that impacted me um, because I could, I, there's nothing I could do about that. <laughs> exactly. uh, nothing I could do about being so dark. So um, exactly. those things mess with your self-esteem and actually give you a chronic state of stress. When you go out and you're the only dark person, you know, you look at yourself and you say, man, I wish I was different. That stress, it damages us. So racism is a statement about a person's value and resources most often go where value is perceived. So when we talk about stress equals demands minus resources, you can look at this statement and realize that in <laughs> fact, when racism is a part of a society, as many people are having this epiphany now about systematic racism and all this stuff, which, um, you know, for many people, you just kind of learned how to live with it. That's what my, my mother described. You, you find a way to live with it and to thrive despite it. Um, but resources go where we think things are valuable. Um, and that's one of the challenges the Black community faces. Absolutely. So racism is a unique stressor. Um, because it allows, I mean, so for example, when any of these things happen, one of the things that happens is, you know, with any of these deaths, we all collectively, our stress goes up. Um, I'm looking all the way back at Trayvon Martin, who's a, a middle on the left over there on, uh, here. Um, I remember when that happened, it was very stressful to me because I thought, yeah. you know, my son, myself, anybody could be walking and, you know, uh, based on a stand your, stand your ground law, you could be killed um, defending yourself and, you know, the person not even face, face uh, justice. So th these things uh, create a, a, a cooperative burden of stress unique again to African-Americans. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I'm going to chime in that even my 13-year-old son, that he expressed some fear and apprehension with even going outside. It's the kindest, sweetest soul that I know and still Despite this, because he's nearly six feet at age 13 on the whole food plant-based side or nearly that, right? Uh, he, he, he's afraid that this stress or this awareness of what's going on is causing stress with him and building up as it is with you and I as well. So we know that racism is a stress. It is a stressor on our bodies. And that's the unique stress that, that African-Americans face that differs from other ethnic groups. You know, one of the things that we see here in the great work done by Dr. David Williams at Harvard, and he describes something called the everyday discrimination scale. And you just ask yourself for a moment, have you ever been treated with less courtesy than others? Have you ever frequently been treated with less respect than others? Have you ever received poor service than others? 
right? Those are some of the things. Have you uh, ever had people not think that you're smart? People uh, acting as if they're afraid of you or people acting like you're dishonest, gripping their purse bag as they get into the elevator. You know, there's, there's a great demo that was put out by Procter & Gamble, a short video clip. This is about three or four years ago where they show an African-American male with his son walking through and he's dressed with a hoodie on and a hat on and he's just walking. And you watch the interactions of everyone around, gripping, treating him like he's dishonest, eyeing him skeptically. And they fast forward as they see him walk in and all of a sudden it, it breaks open to a courtroom scene and you're waiting to see him as a victim of being falsely accused and he enters in as the judge. And they're kind of describing really the importance really about the fact that we have to, to, to change the way in which we look at individuals and the way in which we do things. And that's what this everyday discrimination scale points to these microaggressions that build on a continual basis. You can see here, this is actually before all of the recent things that have been happening. This study from Berkeley, racial discrimination linked to a higher risk of chronic illness in black women. Um, Professor Amani Allen uh, put that study out. Uh, women who said they faced racial discrimination on the job and housing and from the police were 48% more likely to develop breast cancer than those who reported no incidents of major discrimination. Another study of African-American women found that those who reported chronic emotional stress due to their experience of racism had more severely blocked carotid arteries. I mean, you're looking at cancer, heart disease, top two killers in this country. Um, and we're finding that, that, that um, uh, the racism, real or perceived, uh, literally acts uh, synergistically um, with other factors to make things worse. Mm -hmm. And studies show um, uh, so increased coronary artery calcium scores in the patient with racial discrimination stress. Uh, so, I mean, this, this runs a gamut. Remember, heart disease is the most dangerous thing in America in terms of numbers. And we're finding out that racism actually makes all of that worse. One study found that black women had shorter telomeres than white women. At the same chronological age, black women had accelerated biological aging of about seven and a half years. And I'll let Columbus explain what this means. Yeah, you know, I mean, here's the crazy part, right? So telomeres, we all have this DNA and we all believe, right? Our DNA is our destiny. You know, many people like to say, well, the reason why perhaps African-Americans and others are at risk is because of solely genetics. Well, our telomeres are like the ends of our shoelaces. They're the caps. And we all know that once those caps get, go away and, they, and the shoelaces become frayed, there it goes. We're not able to thread those shoelaces through our shoes any longer. Well, it's the same thing with our DNA. The DNA, as those caps begin to shrink, there goes our age. And so what it's telling us is that although we love the statement that, you know, uh, black don't crack and that you look great and you can see an African-American woman in her 70s and she looks like she's in her 40s, we're cracking on the inside and there's issues that are happening on the inside. I went to Australia and was fortunate enough, I love Australia, I visit there often, um, often enough anyway, I've been there a few times and, um, I, they took me to a health department to do a tour when I was up in, um, I think I was in Cairns at the time, and um, or in Northern Australia somewhere, and they took me to the health department and they had these posters and it blew my mind um, that the health department or the health agencies in Australia put out um, these posters to try and show that racism against the Aboriginal people there actually made them sick. And you can see it talks about blood pressure, anxiety and depression on the young man and damages my heart, blood pressure, my unborn baby in the young woman. And we don't get a lot into the maternal child um, aspects of this, uh, but we could. And it, it is proven um, that there's a huge impact on birth outcomes based on the same perception around race. Absolutely, absolutely. So the one thing is we gave you the equation earlier that stress equals demands minus resources. That when your, your demands outweigh your resources, there by therefore your stress. Well, I also want to present another equation, which is that our health is uniquely tied to our resiliency divided by our stress. That means that every action, every interaction in life is either adding to our resiliency or is adding to our stress. The higher our stress, the poor, our health is what we're seeing beyond a, sh a shadow of a doubt. The higher our stress, the poor our health. And what do many of us do when we, we uh, get stressed? 
uh, well, I, I've said in times gone by in the past, we, we go on a double date with Ben and Jerry's. We, we go and we partake <laughs> of things that we might not otherwise do. And, and so we know that stress is just simply desserts spelled backwards. And this is a powerful interaction that our, our stressful situations, the way we perceive them, can impact our choices in life. And this was no more described than Baba Shiva out of Stanford a little over two decades ago, where he took a group of individuals. One group, he gave a complex series of numbers to remember. And another group, he gave a very short one or two numbers to remember. They had to go and present this. They had to say the information back in front of an audience where they were going to be critiqued. But as they exited the room where they were trying to learn and master the notes, they were asked one simple question, which would you rather? the chocolate cake or the fruit. And the overwhelming uh, uh, consensus was they chose the cake in the group that was stress. That stress test showed it that there's a distinct relationship that not only does stress make us reach out more for these foods, these high fat foods, these comfort foods, but, but they also can produce a stressful state in our body, what we characterize as nutritional stress. So it's a vicious cycle that our actions and our interactions can bring about a desire for these foods and these foods in turn spur on that cortisol state that Dr. Walsh brought on earlier that happens just from fear or flight, this stress hormone called cortisol. And what we're seeing is that the foods we eat, eating these can form disease forming foods. So nutritional stress is, not, is, is eating disease forming foods, but it's also not eating health promoting foods. So I don't know if you got that. So nutritional stress is eat, not just eating disease-forming foods. It's not eating health-promoting foods. Oftentimes, you hear people all the time, I don't do this. I don't do that. But what do you do for your health? That becomes the question, the quintessential question. The foods we eat can create this stress in our bodies. And there's a great study that was done. There were several small studies that were done. And what they did was they characterized the amount of cortisol levels in the body when looking at people who partook of a, a high animal fat, low carbohydrate diet compared to those who are eating a low fat diet or low animal protein diet in a high carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate diet. And they found that the, the spectrums diverged. They saw a marked increase in, in cortisol levels for those eating animal products and a drop, a decline in those eating the uh, plant rich proteins. Now, here's the thing. We know that the higher the stress hormone levels called cortisol are, the more you're likely to have increased mortality, more cardiovascular death. For us men out there, what we know is that it's also related to your testosterone levels, right? So when your testosterone, we see these that many times they've done studies, bodybuilders, the testosterone level is lower from all the animal products. But when you shift from eating a high animal protein diet to a lower animal protein diet and a high complex carbohydrate, plant rich foods, you increase or bolster that. So there's power that's there. So that's one avenue in which these foods we eat can really contribute to stress in our bodies, almost a one to one of stress hormone relationship, but they also create this thing called oxidative stress. Now this oxidative stress and advanced glycated end products, these are things, these technical terms, real simply, it's just like an apple decaying. I'm gonna give you a hint. When you have berries, they don't turn brown. When you have a banana, you cut it, or an apple, they turn brown. That's a process of oxidation. And so simply put, all it means is that we walk around happy. We walk around happy and we're ready to go out. And an example I give a lot of times, I go out in, in the community and if I go out and I leave home where I came out from my historically black college and university ready to tackle the world and I'm sheltered in my home or a, an institution, I go out and now someone looks at me different. They come in and they take away my joy. These are the free radicals. They take it away and they snatch this, my confidence, through microaggressions, assuming I'm less smart, assuming that I, there's nothing wrong with it, but being a janitor as opposed to a physician. These are the free radicals that are taking things away. And so when we look in terms of this, antioxidants are the foods and the power that's stored in plant-rich foods that donate back these atoms to the, to the atoms so they can remain healthy. And so when you have these antioxidants pouring through your system, you're able to offset the impact of, of bad food, of toxins, of these things that were in this constant struggle against disease becomes important. 
You know, but many of us think, man, I'm not eating that kind of food. I don't eat, that's not our people's food. They think that, that, that their legacy, that their heritage is different than what we tell them in terms of plant-rich force. They think that soul food is their legacy. And, and what we want to let folks know is that we have a different legacy. That if we go back further in time and we start to do that DNA testing, uh, and we start to go in and figure out where our legacy really truly comes from, we're going to find that it comes from a land rich in fruits and vegetables and root tu tubers and things of that nature is what we're going to see. So on a trip, I was able to go to Ghana um, and um, spoke at the University of Ghana in Lagon and went out to the Ashanti Kingdom and was able to visit some of the markets. And I can tell you, uh, when you go to Africa, what people tell you is that, you know, the image we've been given in America since we were children is the idea that Africans are starving, that they don't have food, when in fact, uh, the richest super greens in the world are in Africa, and the variety of foods, plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, is just absolutely incredible. Um, and our real legacy goes back before slavery. You get here, here's the, the, you look at the rise of Africa, super, super vegetables. Um, agriculture researchers and nutrition experts argue that indigenous vegetable, vegetables are richer in protein, vitamins, iron, and other nutrients than non-indigenous foods. Africa probably has the richest food, just like they have all of the metal and the gold. <laughs> they got all the nutrients, uh, more nutrients in the food as well. Um, so, um, when you look at this one, we, we talk about the, um, the change in food. So, you know, we just meant, we talked about antioxidants a second ago and how the, in order to protect itself, the plant, when it gets hit by sunlight, has these antioxidants to protect itself that when we eat it, we get it. That's what we had in Africa. But once we um, uh, were turned into a commodity, that all switched. And this is really critical to understand. Uh, in order to um, control slaves, food became weaponized in a sense. Um, so this says food was an important element of the process of turning, turning humans into com commodities. The rations were scientifically calculated and their science wasn't the best science on a slave ship. Uh, rations were scientifically calculated to provide the cheapest minimal nutrition to keep enslaved people alive. If the slave ship captain needed, was trying to figure out a way to make extra uh, profit, he would often skimp on food for the slaves. Um, and so it was a harrowing journey across the Middle Passage from West Africa to the Americas because you were nutritionally deprived by the time you arrived. Um, so once, Africa, once Africans got to the New World, um, Africans adapted their cultures uh, to the influences, resources, and severe restrictions they experienced in slavery. Slaves were often, is often were issued what was considered to be the lesser cuts of the hog, such as the feet, the head, the ribs, the fat back, or the internal organs. And, uh, and let me say this, a lot of what we described as, as soul food today was really slave food. It was the food that the master didn't want. It was the feet of the chicken, the neck of the chicken, the chitlin, the guts of a pig. Um, it was um, uh, pig's feet and all of those different things. And all of that was given to the slaves to eat. The slaves figured out a way to try and make all of that stuff taste good, but it was never really meant for human consumption. It's the worst part of an animal. Um, and that is quintessentially how much of what we now call soul food really evolved out of slave food. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I made, I made the mistake, I'll call it a mistake, and I listened to the old slave tapes. I don't know if you've ever listened to those. And the recordings that were done in the early 20th century of, of the re remaining slaves who were alive as they described really some of the atrocities that they went through in their own words and their own voices. And it's available on YouTube, uh, just Googling that. And you listen to just the, the impact of the way in which they were fed in troughs as if they were animals and were given wooden spoons and were allowed and just had to go and fight. And this is out of their own words. It's just powerful and it's unfortunate. So Frederick Douglass, a great um, a leader um, uh, uh, during the abolitionist times, um, just a phenomenal, phenomenal leader. Frederick Douglass recounted that rations consisted of a monthly allowance of a bushel of third rate corn pickled pork, which was often tainted, and porous quality herrings, barely enough to sustain grown men and women through their back-breaking labors in the field. Don't miss this. Slave food during slavery was designed. 
It was designed to give you enough strength to work, but not enough strength to fight. Enough strength to go out and pick cotton, but not enough to pick up arms and try and free yourself or to run uh, to the north. Um, it was designed that way. Um, to keep cost down for the master, but also to keep strength away from the slave. So that, you know, after the slave period, one of the things that they did is that they allowed one day a week, whether it was a Sunday, whatever it was for a celebration, whether or not it was alcohol, whether or not it was certain things, you're able to bake cakes. And, and this idea of wearing your best is wearing your, bringing your Sunday best and having that Sunday dinner was something that really kind of grew as we led out of the slave era into the uh, Jim Crow, excuse me, into, into the, the uh, Great Migration and so forth. And what we saw during this time through, through the Great Migration is that African Americans, for those who don't know, they spread. So my folks are from Louisiana. And my folks kind of spread out to California. There are others who went from different states to Chicago and to New York and to Florida and various areas in order to escape the Jim Crow and the suppression that was there. But one of the things that they met, they, they, they uh, found out when they got there after leaving the war, fighting for the nation and so forth, is they found that there were tons of restrictions placed on them. Richard Rothstein identifies this very eloquently inside of his book, The Color of Law, and looking at the restrictions to even the GI Bill, looking at the restrictions in where you could move or live despite your income in that period of time. As a result of this systemic racism, this de jure racism, this de jure uh, legislation, right? African Americans were prevented from buying homes in certain areas, which prevented them from having school and education, which prevented them as a whole of having that generational wealth, that becomes important, right? And so these are some of the things that, that progress and as a result of it, our living quarters were not as ideal. We, we moved from areas in the farms where even going back to the slave era times, although we were given the cast out, some showed resiliency and being able to plant small gardens and, and certain wild things, dandelions and various things in order to kind of grow to supplement themselves. When they moved into the city, they were no longer able to do that. They were forced to boil or, or fry their foods. They were forced to be an early adopter of fast food. Inside these major cities, African-American studies have shown were early adopters of Chinese, Italian, Tex-Mex far before the mainstream public. That they revealed these lack of kitchen facilities, as I mentioned, led to the increased use of quick frying and boiling methods on the run because they shared kitchen sources. This is what led to our, our, this mindset of eating the way that we did. And as things progress and progress, as we entered into this Jim Crow era, we weren't allowed to go inside of restaurants. You were given your, your lunch on the side window. So we became early adopters of this drive-through mentality. Let's go through the drive-through and let's get through. And so as the civil rights era came and thank the Lord it did, and revolution began, and we're still seeing protests happen now, that out that rising from the ashes and and there's a great author I'm gonna point to in just a moment, but Richard Nixon they began to to allow small business association loans to revitalize these areas. They said we want to bring business back. And one of the, the quotes from the book I'm, I'll share is that Richard Nixon said any act of racism is an act of communism. And so he said I want to go ahead and give build businesses and we'll put things back up here. And so what did they put? They put in businesses with the highest profit margin. They put in quick serve restaurants, fast food restaurants. They put in liquor stores. And what got shoved out? Grocery stores because of the, yep. the profit margins being small. And so essentially what they did was they created a super sizing of urban America, this book, wonderful book by Dr. Chin Zhao, a little side uh, commercial. She'll be joining us next week for one of our conversations. We'll discuss that a bit further uh, at the end. But supersizing urban America, of how inner cities got fast food with government help. Powerful book, powerful book, creating weapons of mass destruction. I want to jump back in and, and, and just go back and, and, and remind everyone. So when you start um, at the, from the time of the Great Migration, into the Second World War, as the GIs came back um, and the baby boomer generation was being um, introduced into the world, wealth flooded into America. But because of the redlining, we didn't get that wealth. 20 years later, as we fought for more legal rights and the riots happened, the answer now was to flood the neighborhood again with money. 
you know, flood the America again with money, especially those neighborhoods. The problem is it was used to prop up businesses that were highly profitable. And yes, some of the, many of them that may have owned these franchises were African American, but the corporate offices really made out big in getting their foot into these into these neighborhoods. And this created like you know this, this lack of nutritional food became like weapons of mass destruction in our neighborhoods. Um, and again, remember. The stress of not having the, the ability to get the housing and generate the wealth, <laughs> the, the stress of trying to fight for freedom, and then this is the food that is put, put in the neighborhood, neighborhoods. It all ties together. Um, the fast food industry is a $170 billion a year industry. And many of them actually seem to target, uh, and not seem to, they target low-income communities and cluster in neighborhoods with 30% fewer supermarkets than upscale areas. Um, and so you get uh, these food swamps, as it were, um, where you get uh, tons of, of, of cheap, low-cost, but nutritionally sparse foods available and you swamp the neighborhood with this hot cheetos and 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 um and potato chips and you know and, and and soda pops all really inexpensive um but no nutritional value yeah yeah you know when i grew up in 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 south central la and i remember as a kid i loved spending time with my dad and so I remember he would get in the car and my dad did the grocery shopping. I still love doing the grocery shopping. But I remember riding the backseat of his car and we'd go grocery shopping. We wouldn't go inside the neighborhood. We would drive 25 miles. Now, as a kid, I just enjoyed being with my dad. And we'd go in this store and I still remember it like it was yesterday. The lights were bright. The fruit looked just like something out of a magazine piled up high there as we walk in and we would just pick out things and we'd come home and spread out. Little did I know, my dad was driving because we lived in the food desert. Little did I know that other individuals did not have the resources like we did to be able to drive out the neighborhood to go shopping elsewhere. Little did I know that African-Americans who rely upon public transportation are limited by the number of, of grocery bags they can carry are unable to really eat that way because there's a lack of, of food inside these areas that are quite destitute. And so it's, it's unfortunate what's there. And, 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 and as a result of this, we see that this fast food and this brand recognition, we see who are the highest consumers of fast food? African-American women. 43% mm -hmm. of African-American women partake of fast food, quick service food. And, and I wanna let you know, fast food isn't just something through a quick serve restaurant. It's also fast food from a grocery store. It's also fast food things that melt in your mouth, not in your hands. That are highly ultra palatable are the things that happen there. And we know that when you live near these fast food restaurants, which seem to target communities of color, that target communities that are underserved, it is definitively linked to heart attacks. We see an increased level of heart attacks occur inside these neighborhoods. And one of the things we know is that um, a lot of the advertising actually it targets um, black youth. Um, so food companies disproportionately target advertising for many of the least nutritious brands to, directly to black consumers. Money spent to advertise on black targeted TV channels, um, 135 million from the fast food, um, uh, other restaurants like that candy, sugary drinks and snacks, uh, 2 million uh, yogurt and 100% juiced, 0% plain water, fruits, and, vets, and vegetables. No money at all there. Um, th th it's targeted uh, because um, for a lot of reasons, uh, especially when you consider the stress levels, um, we become high consumers of these products. Absolutely. And here's one of the things. Here's the part. So we know that advertisement is targeted, but we didn't know that we paid for this advertisement. So we didn't know that our tax dollars actually go to something called the dairy checkoff system. And these tax dollars, despite our government telling us that, hey, we should drink, we should ask for water instead of a, a sugar-filled beverage, mm -hmm. that, that we should have smaller portions, that we shouldn't eat a robust amount of cheeses because they're rich in saturated fats. Despite that, we actually, the government actually pays for the advertisement of many of these things from our, our favorite fast food places is what we see on a regular basis. And so some studies have shown there's in their magazine, it's a nearly a $5 return for a dollar investment and in participating in the dairy checkoff program for these dairy farmers that are there. Not only that, we see that when we look at federally subsidized products, which are tend to be as far as in the, the cheeses and the fats and things of that nature, 
that when you eat these things, the government tells us that we should eat a robust amount of fruits and vegetables, that we should eat a, a fair amount of whole grains and corn and wheats and oats and things, things of that nature. They tell us that we should have these, but yet on the contrary, when we look, we see that the, mo the bulk of their, their, their subsidized uh, products go into sugar, it goes into alcohol, it goes into oils, corn oil, and soybeans, things of that nature is predominantly and very little is spent on fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Lastly, what we know is that when you eat the food that the government, not what they say, you know, there's one thing that always happens. I remember when I was in college, a good friend of mine, Brian Hardy, would always do something. I'd say, Brian, are we going to go and play basketball? And he would shake his head no and say yes. His actions were different than his words and would throw me off. It took me a while to kind of figure it out. And so in many sense, the government's saying something completely different than what they espouse. They say they're, they're, they're supporting and spending dollars towards right. foods that have adverse effects on us, foods that lead to increased cardiometabolic syndrome among U.S. adults compared to the foods that actually are life savings. Are we mm -hmm. eating the foods? Go ahead. And I was going to remember that, that that's tax dollars. So literally, we're that's paying to fund uh, the production of high fructose corn syrup, soybean oils, um, and other processed foods um, that are detrimental. And, you know, tying the bowl together on all this. So first, the government gives us small business association loans to build up our communities with fast food uh, uh, places. Then they give tax dollars to advertise and help develop foods for those fast food agencies, right? And then they subsidize the makers and growers of the food. And so it's a vicious cycle. That's interesting that those are the components of the crucible that leads to increased disease inside of many communities of color. And unlike, unlike the, the, the cigarette industry, the cigarette industry, the tobacco industry was sued because um, they were dishonest, saying their product wasn't addictive when it clearly was. Um, when they were adding additives to make it more addicting, they were sued and they won. Um, the food industry doesn't do that. The food industry literally says, bet you can't eat just one. The food industry says, once you pop, you can't stop. Um, and so, uh, again, these comfort foods. And what we know is that there's a, there's a, there's a we call an unholy trilogy um, of processed three, three uh, components, two of which at least are very highly processed in many cases, and that's sugar, fat, and salt. Um, and when you mix these together, you can actually make quite an addictive um, uh, combination of foods. And um, I think we'll show a slide here of my, uh, Michael Moss's book, uh, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, here in a second. Um, but um, what we know is that you can actually, the food industry actually designs the food to have this kind of response um, so that they can actually um, get more people to buy their product. I was talking to someone from the food industry this week, and it was like, that. Well, you know, that's what they signed up to do. They want to make money. That's why they do this. It's not because they hate you. It's just this is their business. Um, my question then is, where's the ethics in that? If you're literally making a food that people can't stop eating and it's going to lead them to needing medications and, you know, surgeries and, and, and early deaths, um, where, 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 do we, where do we stop this? And like for right now, it's to educate ourselves and to know different. It's literally, when you eat food, it's not, you're not just eating something. These foods are designed, um, many of them, to have the maximum amount of stimulation in your brain. The most addictive food known to man and, and in multiple uh, surveys and studies I've looked at is pizza uh, because it's a powerful combination of salt, sugar, and fat. The white crust is, just turns into sugar. So white bread, white rice, white floury foods. Um, the cheese is loaded with salt and fat. Um, and so when you, you mix the marinara sauce, often also has um, sugar. The meat you put on top is plenty of fat and salt. I mean, it is a, it is a smorgasbord of all of these things. And what happens now is you get a massive rush. In fact, um, in the book, he describes that when you crunch um, certain foods, like certain chips and stuff, you get this crunch that makes your brain think you're biting into like a fresh apple. When in fact, what's actually happening is you're being tricked. Um, and there's this whole um, disappearing calories component that then the thing melts quickly in your mouth right away. And so your brain thinks you didn't, you didn't eat anything. So you can just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. 
And it's this bliss point and crunch point that, that speaks to the food being more satisfying and more palatable to you. And all of that is designed. Now, here's what I want you to get. Just like during slavery, the parts of the food that the master didn't want was given to the slaves. I want to submit to you that today a similar thing has happened. The parts of the dairy industry, um, corn, um, industrial, agricultural industry, um, and other components that are being mass produced through ta with taxpayer subsidies is now being taken and given back to uh, the American people um, and in our case, disproportionately to African-Americans, and it does the same thing. It gives you enough strength to get up and go to work, but not enough strength to really fight for a better life and a better future, not giving you the clarity of mind and strength of body to build the best possible life. Absolutely. 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 It's, it, it is a form of slave food, these foods that are addictive. And all these things, the cookies and the pizza and the ice cream are the most addictive foods that are out there that essentially make us enslaved to it. We end up becoming enslaved to our communities where we may have restricted choices. We become enslaved to the government subsidies, which make certain food products lower. We become enslaved really to this desire of stress and this, this rat race that we involve, we evolve in. And that's why slave food is the manipulation of nutrition for profit and for power aimed at communities at risk, aimed at communities at risk is the key. So how does this work? So we, we, let's go, let's go a little deeper. So we talked a bit about, and we, and again, this is our overview session. We're going to go deeper into all of this over the next few Friday nights. Um, so you got to stay, um, stay, stay, um, tuned in. Um, someone is sending us a message now. Well, how do you break the addiction? We're coming to that. We're coming to that. So, uh, the food and beverage industry, spends about $2 billion a year marketing to children. The fast food industry spends more than $5 million every day marketing unhealthy foods to children. Nearly all, 98% of the food advertisement viewed by children are for product, products that are high in fat, sugar, or salt, or a combination of the three. Most of that food, 79% of it, has no fiber, which is one of the missing links we'll talk about later on. One study found that when children were exposed to television content with food advertising, they consumed 45% more food than children exposed to content with non-food advertising. So why would you spend millions of dollars on a, um, on, a, um, on, a, on a commercial that lasts a minute or 30 seconds or less? Because it works. And that's what this is showing us. Each day, African-American children see twice as many calories advertised in fast food commercials as white children. Because again, if you target black channels um, or programming more likely to be watched by blacks, you can actually do this. Um, and so Joe Furman, one of the pioneers in all of this, um, uh, he, he really speaks to this. I love this quote. I'm going to read the quote for you from his book, Eat to Live. And he has another phenomenal book, um, Fast Food Genocide, that we would recommend yes. as well. Um, yes. But here it is. It says, the modern food and drug industry has converted a significant portion of the world's people to a new religion, a massive cult of pleasure seekers who consume coffee, cigarettes, soft drinks, candy, chocolate, alcohol, processed foods, fast foods, and concentrated dairy fat, cheese, in a self-indulgent orgy of destructive behavior when that when the inevitable results of such bad habits appear appear pain suffering sickness and disease the addicted cult members drag themselves to physicians and demand drugs to alleviate their pain mask their symptoms and cure their diseases these revelers become so drunk on their addictive behavior, behavior and the accompanying addictive thinking that they can no longer tell the difference between health and health care. And I was, um, I was on a panel this week, a um, uh, local panel here in, in, in the greater Hartford area, and um, that's one of the things I had to chime in and say. I mean, everybody was access to health care, access to health care. I said, but I think access to health care is critically important, it but it, it does not mean health. Um, and that's one of the things we, we try to emphasize. Correct, correct. And so, you know, getting back to Michael Moss, who kind of really breaks down, gives us like a bird's eye view of, of like the fly on the wall who's sitting there and peering in to seeing what happens inside of these companies, how they target everything from your age group to your gender to your ethnicity 
That's why you find when you go into certain grocery stores and certain, in certain neighborhoods, you have different products that are upfront, different products that are on sale, different things that you can't get in one neighborhood that you can get in another because they are tailored and it's very detailed. It's a business is what he identifies. And, and these three, this, this evil triad of salt, sugar, and fat is so important. And I see it in my daily, daily practice because salt, we know, plays a role in cardiovascular events. Now, many African-Americans suffer with something. They have a gene for a salt sensitivity gene, which means that as you partake of salt and sodium, your blood pressure has a tendency to rise a lot higher. And what, so we know that, that one teaspoon equals 2,000 milligrams of sodium. But what's interesting about this slide is that when you move from West Africa all the way through the Caribbean and into the, the States, you find a progressive rise in the occurrence of blood pressure. That in actuality, in West Africa, with the dietary practices there, and this is say from 2001, it showed that there was it's even lower than the levels inside the United States for, for all ethnic groups. And so this state was repeated, and it was recently reported in the uh, American Medical Association this past year, looking at the fact that you once again still see this trend occurring, that this salt has a devastating impact on the body that as we eat these salted foods and we don't pay attention to the sodium per serving size that's there, that it can, it can impact our brain, that we know it can impact the heart, increase the volume going coursing through the blood flow. It can actually damage the lining of the vessels called the endothelium. And in a different lecture, I'll let you know about that's the secret sauce to health, to cardiovascular health. It can impact the kidneys. It can impact too as well all these things independent of your blood pressure. So you may walk around saying, but doc, my blood pressure is good. I can have as much salt as I want. It still does these things independent of your blood pressures, what the studies have shown from uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology. That when we reduce our salt intake, just reducing by one teaspoon a day, we can save over two and a half million lives every single year. It means it's less suffering from heart attacks and from strokes. It's a less of a progression. You know, this is an important area uh, to me because my father-in-law basically died as ill effects of high blood pressure for years upon years upon years that led to kidney failure. One of the things I mentioned that then ended his life unnecessarily soon. So we see these things happen. We look at sugar, another component. So this is irrespective. A lot of times I'll tell folks, they'll say, but doc, I'm, 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 I'm gluten-free. Doc, I'm vegan. Doc, I'm, I'm vegetarian. Doc, I'm this, I'm that, or the other. I said, the greatest enemy is the standard American diet. The standard American diet hails salt, sugar, and fat, and it takes many forms. Mm -hmm. You can be standard American diet vegan style. You can be standard American diet vegetarian style. So the goal is seeing how can we eat foods that can reduce these amounts because we know sugar is addictive. Sugar is addictive that when you eat this sugar, you crave it. I never forget when I was starting out on this journey, and I've never been horrible, but I was a remember recovering sugarholic. I was a junk foodaholic, is what I was. And I remember going to the grocery store. I had my cart loaded up with all these vegetables and fruits. And in that last moment, I snatched the candy bar and put it on the conveyor belt. <laughs> I snatched not just one, I snatched two or three of them. And I remember never forget that checkout clerk looking at me. He said, Doc, he didn't call me Doc. He was like, Man, I thought you were the healthiest person I'd ever seen until I saw you just like the rest of us. I'll never forget that from about 15 years ago. And I know the, the power that this has on us, despite our desire to do something different. I was enslaved to that candy. I was enslaved to it. That it spikes your blood sugar. It's what ends up happening. You get this so surge of dopamine, but then it drops instantaneously because now the insulin goes to storage hormone hormone trying to to store it but because of that now the blood sugar drops and the craving the vicious cycle just continues on and on and you go back for more and more this mindless eating that's there the vanishing calories as as dr walsh mentioned a bit earlier that we see it and here's the key when we add in the sugar to our tea we add in the sugar to our coffee we add in the sugar to whatever it is, we're increasing the risk of heart disease is what studies have shown, as much as four times increase the risk based on our calories. That as the serving sizes increases, there goes to as well our ingestion of this deadly white substance called sugar. Takes us to the next one is, is fat. That's huge. 
And this is this one is one that really sinks a lot of us as Americans because our foods are made to be fatty because it the way the fat melts in the mouth it it sends pleasure signals through the brain and um you can see looking at the graph to the left that added fats um have increased in this country. Um, when you look at the, especially oils, a lot of people think, well, olive oil is good for me, coconut oil is good for me. The problem is all fat is about 120, 140 calories a tablespoon. So you think about putting a, you know, filling up the bottom of a pan with oil and dropping something in it, and it absorbs all that fat. Imagine all the calories you add. And remember, the oil has no fiber. So it, the, the, that key ingredient that we keep kind of skirting around, there's none of it in there. This massive increase in oil is one of the reasons I believe we've seen an obesity epidemic. It's one of the key contributing factors is that fats in general, of course, but, the, but it's also the, the, the increase in the use of oils. Uh, because again, oils don't, they really have no nutritional value. Um, um, and they can hide in food. Um, and one of the things that happens is there is no real physiological process needed to digest them. They can be absorbed directly through the gut wall into the bloodstream and be deposited directly into fat cells. So it literally goes from your lips to your hips. And uh, so a fat is unique and oil is unique. Of course, when you look at it right here, Southern food, fried foods, raised risk of stroke, um, a new study shows and, you know, that food, when you do all of that oil you bring in, all of it is going to be easily absorbed. Um, and along with the salt in the foods, it really causes havoc. Absolutely. And I just don't want, I want to highlight something you said, which is the fried foods. When we boil that heat, that oil, we change the moiety of it, the chemical structure of it. And it says have shown that causes tremendous harm to our bodies, increase the risk of cancer, that when we, we high heats to the oil are damaging to our body and to to everything as a whole. We look at TMAO, and TMAO is a fancy term. I always kind of give the analogy. That's basically, we're more bacterial DNA than we are actually human DNA. That's really the crux of the matter. And, and what stays, this is a new frontier in medicine. We're finding out that that gut bacteria, that really determines so much. It determines your mental outlook. If you're prone towards depression or anxiety or bipolar, it determines whether or not you're prone towards cancer or heart disease or diabetes. It determines all of these things. It even can determine if you're prone towards uh, gaining weight or not. And so what studies have shown is that this can be stimulated, these gut bacteria, when animal protein is taken in, animal fats, right? That it can increase the production of something called trimethylamine oxide that increases the risk of hardening of your vessels, corrosion of your vessels we call atherosclerosis, leading to stroke and heart attack and to kidney problems too as well. So there's power in our choices as we go about these things. And that TMAO is actually inherent as, uh, um, uh, you know, as mentioned, I mean, literally comes from the um, creatine in the meat and it's broken down and comes in. And so you, you hard to avoid it with animal products. Um, and so it's not just the protein side of the animal product. They, this graph shows you that the fat side of the animal product also, it, they kind of work in conjunction. So uh, on the left, on the y-axis of this graph is age adjusted death rate per 100,000 population. On the x-axis, animal fat intake. And as you can see, as you go up in um, animal fat, amounts, you go up, it corresponds pretty well as you go up in age-adjusted death rate um, due to breast cancer. I want to submit to you that um, it's ironic because I've seen some uh, fried chicken places actually, um, you know, doing the um, breast cancer awareness stuff on their buckets. That is crazy because what we what the science is beginning to really show us, and I, and really does show us, is that that those foods may actually be what causes breast cancer, or at least contribute significantly to it uh, in the first place. So we a lot of people ask us about fish. Um, and fish, um, part of the problem uh, we, as we go through this is with increased mercury uh, because of what the pollution in the oceans, um, um, increase the risk of heart disease. All of the omega-3 fatty acids everybody wants can be gotten from somewhere else. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, at a later time as well. Um, there are more pollutants um, which concentrate to the, littler, the smaller 
deeper fish, you have to eat by a bigger fish, and then it, it, it bioaccumulates as you come up the chain. So when you get that big piece of fish and you eat it, you get all of that pollutant into you. Even when they farm raise the fish to try and get it away from the pollutants, they have to dump tons of antibody, antibiotics into that water because the fish are too close, and so they get, get infections. So you get a lot of um, antibodies. And of course, there's higher risk of kidney stones and gout um, related to this. Um, uh, some fish even has higher cholesterol, or some fish, some forms of fish have higher cholesterol levels than even like a, a um, than pork does, which a lot of shocks a lot mm -hmm. of people. Um, so this one here um, just shows you meat consumption, meat consumption yeah. um, by ethnicity. I'll let Columbus talk about this one. Yeah. I mean, just basically inside of every category, African Americans tend to lead the charge as it relates to um, the ingestion of animal products with the exception of beef. So across fish and turkey and chicken and pork, we tend to lead the, the highest as it, as it relates to consumption. And just for folks out there, pork is not the other white meat. It is indeed red meat, as is lamb and everything else. And it's one of the ones that causes a great deal of complications, as we see here. And one of the things that I found fascinating is when this came out, um, and literally internationally, one of the things that happened is that um, from the World Health Organization down, they began to recognize the processed meats are, were given a group one classification as a carcinogen, um, which is the highest level you can get. And then the red meats were given a group two A classification. Um, so as you can see, this, the, again, the science is beginning to show that in fact, we don't just get cancer because it just floats around in, the, in, our, in our society. It is directly tied back to some of the foods that we eat, um, like, like a hot dog. Yeah, yeah. And we, and we, yeah, go ahead. We see these things happen with diabetes, but like you were saying with cancer, it's there too as well. With colon, prostate, bladder cancer, as well as the diabetes, that ingestion of these processed meats, it increases the risk astronomically. So one of the other tough things, I mean, I grew up um, drinking cow's milk, whole milk. Um, I didn't know you could live without it. I was told, you know, milk, it does a body good. And, and, you know, milk gives you strong teeth and bones and makes you do all, it makes your hair grow, your muscles grow. Everything was good because of milk. Um, and so it, increasing rates of childhood overweight and obesity is related to, the, to dairy increased animal protein intake and higher dairy consumption is associated with earlier average menarche. Um, what we found is that the age of, 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 of the onset of, of, of menses in, in girls has really come down over the years. Uh, exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals as well. So dairy has some unique um, things that it does um, to really uh, cause problems for the developing child. This study showed um, followed you know about a hundred thousand people sixty one thousand men forty five thousand women for more than twenty years um, and eleven years respectively among the women for each glass of milk consumed the risk of dying from all causes increased by fifteen percent risk of heart disease increased by fifteen percent and a risk of cancer increased by seven percent for the women who consume three plus glasses of milk per day compared with less than one, the risk of dying increased by 93%. Men had a 10% increased risk of dying when consuming three or more glasses of milk per day compared with less than one glass. We also talk about eggs. I, one of the things that was difficult for me to give up was eggs. Um, I grew up, you know, my grandfather would fry us some eggs on a Sunday morning. And that was like a treat of the whole week um, when I was a kid. And so scrambled eggs, omelets. And I actually, when I was began to really look at this, and I, I, I literally was like praying and saying, well, should I give up eggs? Two studies came across my desk, um, and they are supported in what is here. Two scientific uh, peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, did you know that one egg has the same amount of cholesterol as a Big Mac with more than 60% of calories from fat? Consuming eggs can also increase the risk of cardiovascular disease by 19%, colon cancer nearly five times, diabetes 68%, and here's the one that scared me as a black man, lethal prostate cancer by 81%. Um, knowing how devastating prostate cancer is uh, to black men, uh, especially not just black American men, Jamaican men uh, have high rates as well. Um, that was one of the things that really shocked me and, and caused me to, 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 to say, all right, I, I got to leave out eggs. Um, some people say, what about the egg whites? Remember, it is animal protein 
that is the problem. Um, uh, and when, you, when you're looking at um, cancer. Yeah, you know, so it's time we have to have a change of heart. We have to really decide what's important to us and what are we living for? Are we eating to live? Or are we living to eat? Is the proverbial question that exists for all of us. Do we believe that black lives matter, that black health matters in, in terms of this or not? And we have to have a change of heart. We have to use our nutrition for resiliency instead of stress. Remember that equation, our health is tied to our resiliency divided by our stress. Every action, the things that we do are either adding to resiliency or adding to our stressors that we have to focus. It's not just, oftentimes I'll hear, doc, I don't care about living forever. I don't care about living forever. Well, I agree, that's called a lifespan. There's a beginning and there's an end. Our health span is what I'm talking about. Our goal is to extend that time that you're free of seeing people like me in the hospital and Dr. Walsh. That health span is that time that you're not chained to pills and, and procedures on a regular basis. That health span is the time that allows you to work and enjoy life with your family and vacation and enjoy life. Those are the things that give you the health span. The health span is the time that gives you the energy to fight for change, for social action. And so that's really what we're speaking to is what can we do to contribute to increase our health span? recognizing we can't guarantee an extension of, of lifespan. And so what studies have shown, Dean Ornish has done tremendous work. He's one of the forerunners inside of the area of lifestyle medicine. And what he showed is that when individuals adopted a whole food plant-based diet, when they moved towards eating foods rich in fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, beans and legumes, that all of a sudden, as well as exercising, giving up smoking and trying to work on their outlook, they found that their PSA levels starting high drop down low. And those who continued in the same process, their, their prostate-specific antigen levels for men with prostate rose as opposed to going down. That was power there. Not only that, they took the blood from these individuals and it was like superpower blood. This blood was more likely to kill cancerous cells than in individuals who had eaten food products rich in recognizable foods, fiber-rich foods, foods filled with vegetables that have singular ingredients like broccoli, like kale, like spinach, like uh, mustard greens, all these things of that nature there compared to the con control group. He not only did that, but he also took his talents in my area, which is the lifestyle heart trial, and kind of laid out one of the groundbreaking trials. He took the castoffs. Every blue moon, I'll see a patient who has disease that's so extensive, there's nothing we can do. It brings my attention back to a patient we had where he had such bad disease, even I was unnervous by treating him medically. I was nervous about trying something. And he said, Doc, I don't want anything. I'll do whatever you said. And I want to tell you that he decided that he would go ahead and transform his diet. And he did well. So this was comparable to Dean Ornish's uh, 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 research. He showed that individuals were able to decrease their angina within a short time period. That means that chest discomfort, that shortness of breath. He showed in a short period of time that they were able to improve blood flow to the vessel, to their heart walls. Those are powerful things of knowing that we can, and there's been subsequent studies to validate this there. Studies out of Loma Linda have shown it's not all or none phenomena. I tell people this all the time. You don't have to think, oh, I can't do it, it's too hard for me. When you go from eating any and everything, which is the orange bracket, down to a plant predominant diet, which is a green bracket, all of a sudden we see that the weights begin to, to drop off. Dr. Walsh can tell you about that. He's seen it. He's experienced it in his own life. You know, we know that when we see going from eating any and everything down to a plant predominant diet, free of, of high levels of salt, sugar, and fat, we see that now the diabetes seems to improve. We see that when you go from eating any and everything down to a plant predominant diet, we see that once again, the blood pressure seems to improve. We see that when you go from eating any and everything, that orange bar, down to a plant predominant diet, we see that once again, the cholesterol levels begin to improve. Other studies have shown that other markers of inflammation have shown to improve. C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker of heart disease, dissipates and goes away. And I'm gonna tell you that this food can, can send the disease running scared. It's no panacea, there's no cure-all. But what it tells us, it's like kicking a field goal from the five yard line versus the 50. It's like shooting a layup versus shooting a three point shot. It's like any of these particular analogies that you have out there is a difference. It's an investment in your health future in the same way in which you put money aside for your financial future. You know, this was shown no better 
than in the study that looked at South Africans, African Americans, excuse me, Africans living in South Africa and swapping their diet with the diet of African Americans living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So as you can imagine, went from highly refined processed foods in America down to highly fiber, mostly plant-rich foods in, in South Africa. And what they found was within two weeks, they turned on and turned off the markers of colon cancer. The changes happen for within faster than they happen without. Don't give up because you don't see the weight dropping off as fast as you want. Don't get up, give up because of the struggles in transforming your mind as you begin the process of changing. There is a work happening within you as you begin down this road. One of the things that fascinated me, I ran into a chapel, uh, chaplain from uh, Maranatha Prisons in Victorville, California when I was doing um, either doing my residency or just after when I was at Loma Linda University. Um, and he described this prison and I found some research on it later on. And the prison gave two uh, ways that you could go. One of them actually was a whole food plant-based uh, eating hab uh, um, uh, um, uh, menu that those prisoners got compared to the standard um, California corrections menu on the other side. What's fascinating is the state of California thought nobody would want that healthier side where they did some other things with the prisoners as well. Um, yet the majority of the prisoners actually chose the healthier side. And what they found was that um, the race-based um, gangs disappeared. Everyone just worked out and played together in the yard. They found that there was less violence. What was most incredible when people ate a whole food plant-based diet and had that as part of their rehabilitation, they found that the recidivism rate uh, went from in the 90% uh, range down to 2%. Interestingly enough, ultimately, the state shut this prison down. And I would argue that maybe because this prison was onto something, when you look at its complete curriculum and its diet in a way to actually help to change the temperament of an individual or, or, and, and help them um, with the process of rehabilitation by actually feeding their brain and their soul with a whole food plant-based diet. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that, that brings us back, you know, I mean, once again, Juneteenth is a day in which freedom we were released, the final slaves from, from Texas. And this date was chosen because we have an opportunity to really get a taste of freedom. Freedom from, from health challenges, freedom from that we're not, our DNA is not our destiny, that we can make an impact and a shift in this process. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna provide you with, instead of a prescription, all right? I'm not, you come to the doc and you want a prescription for whatever the med is. We're gonna give you a plant prescription. And so what I want you folks to do who are listening out there is I want you to, to connect with a support group. It could be a friend. It could be someone online virtual. And sign a contract that you're, you're going to commit to bettering yourself that will allow you to fuel the fire to fight, right? That you're going to go ahead and replace the sodas and sweet teas with water. Where at least at a minimum, at least drink equal parts of water whenever you have some of these other things. I want you to go ahead and increase your level of activity. A car that sits, a person that doesn't move is a person who's waiting for destruction to happen. We want you to focus on your sleep, even if it's something like committing to 10 or 15 minutes additional each, each night. I want you to look at reflection in terms of committing time for thoughtful reflection, meditation, prayer, thanksgiving, things of that nature become important. These are the key components. And as you go down this road, the first step is I want you to get rid of the temptations because I'm going to tell you that, that that thing called stress of life, at the end of the day, if it's sitting there and you have whatever your thing is waiting for you when you come home, guess what? You're probably going to eat it. So you want to try and get that out of your house if you can. The next thing you want to do is you want to plan. Don't allow yourself to get so famished. Studies have shown you go to the grocery store famished, guess what? You're buying everything. <laughs> you, <laughs> you sit down at a restaurant hungry, you're ordering, I want this, 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 and this, right? You're gonna do it. The other last thing I'll tell you is try to avoid the oils. I never forget, my brother-in-law actually said to me, he said, he was like, man, Columbus was, was right. I told him, I said, listen, you can saute your vegetables. You can brown your vegetables. You can get your roux without the oil. Use water. Use, vinegar, use vegetable broth in order to do it. And that way you're able to really decrease the oil content. So the plan, scripture plan is you want to focus on what you are eating for your health. You want to add in one cup of beans or lentils every single day. You want to eat at least one cup of berries or whole fruit every day. 
Eat your three to two or three cups of green leafy vegetables daily. Eat your one cup of grains. Eat two to three tablespoons of raw nuts. Download an app by Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org called The Daily Dozen. Take a look at, 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 at other books that are out there, 22 Day Nutrition, Marco Burgess, and you can look at various things. Sign up for uh, at slayfood.org and you'll get a, a, a special uh, summary that's sent to you about how you can make this transition. You decide where you start. You can say my entry level is, okay, I'm not, I'll, I hear you talk about the processed meats. I'll give up the red meat. I'll give up the processed meat, but I got to hold on to my chicken, fish, and dairy for right now. That's okay because you're going to focus on what you are eating, adding in the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds first. But the goal is you're going to transition through each phase. So you set your time period, one week, two weeks, one month, but you're going to move towards your goal. You're starting this marathon of race towards a better you right now. The next level is that you're going to say red meat, chicken, and fish I'm going to give up, and that's my beginner. Right. Next level is you're going to say, I'm, I'm giving up the dairy. Next level is that you're, you may say, you know what, I'm going to focus on whole foods, foods with a singular ingredients. I won't eat anything unless I can make it inside of my uh, 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 house or kitchen. Next thing I'm going to do for my kids and for myself is I'm going to focus on the three S's, smoothies, salads and soups. That's how I will look to kind of get my myself together to get that supercharged, we all like to see that, that recognition and losing some weight. And this is one method that you can do it to as well. You can be successful. You can transform your life because guess what? Your life matters. The plan description plan, like I mentioned, goal is to advance through each stage. You choose the right stage that's for you. You spend the time that you feel is best for you and yourself. Some people may say, I'm going to start at advanced because I'm like that. Other people may say, I'm going to start at, at entry level. You know, you decide, but guess what? It's okay. Don't kick yourself if you relapse. If you go back, it's okay. Avoid the what the heck, what the hell moment. Say, you know what? I'm still pushing forward. I'm still striving towards a better me every single day. And the, the other thing that's ex extremely important is choose your eating window. Give your body time to repair itself. Give your body, your stomach time to rest too as well. Different ideas of what I do on my busy day. You could choose for breakfast. I may start eating at 10 o'clock and finish up by five o'clock. I may choose a green smoothie, then have a salad, sweet potato and chili and a salad there again. I may have tofu scramble. I may have a, 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 a cereal bowl of, of whole foods. I may have a bowl. I love the bowl method. You start off and you're going to go ahead and you add to these things. This is what we'll do. Different ideas. You're going to get your smoothies on with your green leafy vegetables, your fruits. I don't mean the yogurt. I don't mean the ice cream added to it. I'm not saying that with a few kicks of, of fruit. I mean, you want to load this thing up that's going to energize your body. You can have overnight oats. I'll tell you, in my busy day as a, as a cardiologist, a lot of times what I'm doing is I buy my rice frozen. I buy canned beans. Yes, canned beans, salt free. I rinse off the canned beans. I pop the, the, the rice that's already cooked inside the glass bowl. I add in frozen vegetables. I may throw some pico de gallo on top of it. I put a lid on it. I'm out the door. I have my fast food healthy meal. That's the goal. That is indeed the goal. Get your, get your bowl on and get moving in the right direction. It's really, truly the key to success. You know, one of the things is, is that we have to become a community. Community is something that I think as the world is drawing its attention to, to the Juneteenth, they're drawing their attention to the Black Wall Street. They're drawing attention to the Tulsa massacre. As a community, we have to bind together, bond together. And that community, it doesn't just eliminate other ethnic groups, but as a community, we have to come together because when I is replaced by E, illness becomes wellness. We have to replace that and empower ourselves and create an environment that's supportive. So if what a person's trying to do better and be better, you have to help them be the best version of themselves that they can be. And when you do this, it's a great little study that came out of the location where, where our alma mater is. We can create these black blue zones. I don't know if you all have heard of blue zones. Blue zones are where the most long lived individuals are around the world. The one in North America is Loma Linda, but then you have others in Greece and Italy and, 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 and Japan. But there's also one that may be hidden down in Alabama. And you have a, a great cluster mm -hmm. 
of 90 plus year old individuals who are thriving, who are doing well, who are gardening, who are walking, who are living life well. And that's what ultimately we want is to increase your health span to help you be valuable. I'm gonna turn it over as we finish up to my colleague, Dr. Walsh here. And anything you wanna add in? As we no, we, we, we're going to be doing these more. Um, the recording ultimately will be, will be made available, but um, we have a lot of questions um, that we want to try and get through, um, and we'll we'll go from there. We also know that we got some feedback. There was some some trouble with some people getting on, so we'll make sure for the future um, uh, meetings that that we we fix that. But we will have this recording available, so um, we, you may want to, in case anybody wants to watch it again or send it to others, uh, that will be possible. And we're gonna jump over to uh, Danette and ask her uh, to lead us through the questions um, that came in. Sure, um, and thank you very much, doctors, for an excellent presentation. We received about you know twenty questions, and so I've I've kind of the the ones that we've received. Um, first so i know we don't have a lot of time to cover these um and again as they have mentioned you can go to slavefood.org to register to receive uh, the transcription plan um and we will be sending that out to those who register on slavefood.org um and we will be providing you with a schedule for the upcoming sessions that we will be holding based on what was shared in the slave food plan the first question that we had was um can you speak on fad diets and vegan food in fast food restaurants. Yeah, I think I, yeah, we're we got some technical difficulty there. Um, yeah, hearing Danette, but let me, let me I think I think I heard the question feel are more vegan friendly or um, all right. I think we'll kind of go ahead and get in. Yeah, I, I think, it, um, the yeah, we can, we can answer that. Um, so one of the things that somebody mentioned or asked about fad diets, what we know in America is that fad diets really don't work um, long term for the most part um, because they ask um, for you to remove things uh, that you eventually replace. Um, uh, but I'll let, I'll let Columbus jump in on this one um, and then come back around yeah. to it. Yeah, you know, I think one of the key things is that you have to ask yourself, what question are you asking? And so many times people are asking about diets which I characterize you're gonna die from it, is because they're trying to seek a quick solution to lose weight. If your question is, how can I achieve my healthiest version of myself possible? How can I stave off chronic disease that's preventable? Then the answer to that is really looking at what you're adding to your diet, what you're focusing on, what you are eating for your health. And if you make that your focus first and foremost, eating the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, the beans, the legumes, nuts, and seeds as a start, that is where you'll get the biggest bang for your butt, your buck. I, my general proscript is that I think as it relates to um, vegan meats and vegan products inside of the restaurants, we give up our control when we eat inside of restaurants. And so we'll oftentimes have a lot of added salt in, in sugar and oil at foods. But I think that's a great start. It's a great movement in the right direction is when you decide, okay, I'm going to substitute my whatever type of rack of lamb or steak or whatever and have whatever options are available that are vegan at a restaurant that you find tasty and, and savory. I think that's a wonderful start. I think it's a great thing and I would support that 100%, but I would also ask you to, to focus on those foods, those fiber rich foods, as we mentioned, um, to help you. Um, there was no mention about soy products in your discussion. Is there a reason for that? Um, no, there's we, there's more to come. We'll, we'll talk more about it. One of the big misconceptions in health right now is that somehow soy is bad for you. Um, Soybeans, like all beans, are actually very good for you. Um, what isn't good for you is highly processed soy products, like highly processed anything isn't good for you. Um, and some of the soy um, 
protein isolates that we find in some of the meat substitutes um, are so high packed with proteins that they sometimes seem to function more like animal protein in terms of risk of certain uh, cancers and diseases. Uh, however, if you're eating tofu, um, edamame, um, uh, I think uh, seitan, okay. I mean tempeh is what I'm thinking. Um, you know, those are minimally processed soy products and actually increase health. There's a lie that the phytoestrogens in soy make breast cancer work. In fact, the studies probably showed the opposite is true. It's actually probably protective. So we didn't talk a lot about soy, but when we have time in, in, a, in one of the sessions, we'll really talk more about the diet itself. We'll talk a lot about the importance of beans and legumes because of the, the, the soluble and insoluble fiber, the protein, and many of the um, um, uh, phytonutrients that are found in beans that you can't really find anywhere else in those combinations. Okay, the next question is regarding the chemical change that happens in oil once it's heated. Can you guys speak to that at all? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's one of the key things that you can have. They call it the boiling point with different oils. They have different sets that are there. But what's interesting is that when you look at, there's beyond a shadow of a doubt, no doubt about the relationship between frying foods, barbecuing with that char on the meats that we all perhaps love, that those things can increase disease states. There's no doubt about that. The issue is, is about the oil itself and when you change. So when I look at the health products, healthful benefits of olive oil that are pur purported as far as in some literature, right, the Lyon trial, really they're looking at small amounts. I remember doing the calculation that, uh, from an article that just came out purporting the benefits of oil. They were talking about not even quite a teaspoon a day so, I mean, you know, as opposed to soaking and letting the oil sit there and, it's, and we're frying the foods and we're battering the foods, that's a setup for disease states. And so I realized that for everyone, it's a transition. It's things that you're used to. So what I would once again support is as you enter into a phase, you want to focus on what you are eating. And we'll be able to provide you inside of our in-depth follow-ups really about this a bit more as it pertains to the oil. Are there, uh, are the fast food companies being subsidized in our neighborhoods? Hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Columbus. Yeah. So a great thing, great lead in. So next week, and we'll talk about this, we have the author of Supersizing Urban America who's going to, going to join us on the conversation, did a lot of the research behind it. So as we mentioned, many, not all, have a, are, have a small business association loan through the government. Many participate, receive food products from the dairy checkoff system that then allow their, their um, that, that uh, promote as far as the dairy and the government then subsidizes the dairy industry. So by effect, yes, they are subsidized. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there is a, there's a question about how you would suggest a family transition from their normal meat eating uh, soul food diets to a better diet. And I would assume that that would be through the plan description plan that you will make available or that will be sent out to those who register on slavefood.org. Is that correct? That, that is correct. That is correct. And, and once again, because when you enter into one of those stages, you may choose that I will bake instead of fry. You may choose that I'm going to increase the amount of the fruits and of the vegetables that are there. I may choose not to add marshmallows and sugar to my sweet potatoes. <laughs> I may not add the ham hocks or turkey necks to the, the greens and so forth as I begin to make this transition to make these foods as healthy as possible. And we'd love to help and be part of your journey. What is the best oil to use? There really is no best oil. And this was hard for me because, um, you know, I grew up with, with food being fried. And this, I was very resistant to this one. I was resistant to egg, giving up eggs. And oils was one of the things I really did not want to give up because I like to fry stuff. Um, but what I found is that really it's all uh, fatty acid uh, chains uh, that are easily absorbed into the body. So there's no good ones. Um, now they may have some omega-3s and stuff, but you can get that from chia seeds, flax seeds. Um, there's other sources of those things that are far healthier because oil is highly, highly processed food. It is not whole food. And for that reason, oils in general really aren't good for you. Um, not only will they put weight on you, but um, they are very, they are pro-inflammatory as well. I don't know if Dr. Batiste wants to add anything to that. 
No, absolutely. I mean, you know, when I look strictly at the recommendations, they'll speak to olive oil, and that's based upon a few studies that are there. But like Dr. Walsh said, and like we mentioned multiple times, really, the way in which we go about eating and ingesting these are not ideal for our body. They increase our caloric density too as well, which increase our risk of being obese, increases the fat that increases as far as this whole idea of the metabolic syndrome. So we have to be careful about, about our choices and how we have the food prepared. And I, I do want to just throw in there that one of the ways you can get around this is like air frying. Um, you know, you can that and and I think Dr. Batiste mentioned earlier about um, sauteing with water and um, and um, vegetable broth. Uh, but the air fryer, if you don't add any oil to it, oil is obviously not in it. And you can crisp some things that way. You can buy one and and, and kind of play with it a bit. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have an answer that dispels chocolate milk? And it's per, um, and how it is a good thing for recovery after sports. Mm. Yeah. So the the premise of in terms of of after sports and with milk in general is they're talking really speaking to trying to increase the protein content as well. If you lift weights, after you participate and replenish the body um, and help the muscles grow. Well, what I can tell you is that from a standpoint of of that, we can replace that with healthier items because the milk itself, in terms of its acidity, in terms of its fat content, um, have not really been shown to be extremely beneficial for the body long and short term. And so that's why I dissuade really the use on top of chocolate milk in particular. We're looking at the added amounts of, of sugar the grams of sugar. So remember this when you see grams, this, which is a metric that most of us are not used to looking at. One, four grams equals one teaspoon. So on the back of the label of that carton of whatever it is that says 20 grams, that's five teaspoons right there in that moment of sugar. We have to be careful of the amount of sugar that we're ingesting. And so what many of these products do is that they are adding. That's why cacao is great. It's a rich antioxidant not so good. The milk, rich, has a lot of hormones, can increase the, yeah. the estrogen and other avenues that are there that are less ideal for you. Increases inflammation. As athletes, you want to decrease your inflammation. That's right. By decreasing your inflammation, it allows your recovery, the soreness to dissipate too as well. So we know the berries and, and the cherries that are extremely beneficial and can dilate the vessels and lead to some of the dietary nitrates become important in the rich in antioxidants. Um, so there's a lot. That's a great question. And that really deserves a much longer period of time to give it justify, uh, justified answer. Is there um, one of the slave food talks that you would recommend that they listen in on in the upcoming weeks that might address that a little bit further? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. I think that when we, um, when we talk about the breaking the chains, we may okay. actually speak to that a bit more. Um, so we'll have several on our next slide. I believe we'll go through some of the sessions that will come up. Okay, and there were so many questions, so I apologize that we're not able to get to them all. But the last one that I'm going to uh, present to you guys right now is how do you break the addiction, the food addiction? Let me speak to that um, because I'm someone who has to wrestle with this. I think um, you do it um, intentionally is the first thing. Um, Dr. Batiste mentioned planning and um, not just randomly trying to kind of lumber through this. I think you do have to have a plan and a strategy. Nobody plans to fail. They simply fail to plan. Um, and so that would be the first step. I think then you have to say, okay, what is the low hanging fruit? What behavioral changes can I make that aren't super difficult? And don't underestimate something as simple as getting more sleep because the study showed that um, if you sleep them a proper amount of hours, it's easier to handle your um, appetite the next day. It's, it's easier to control your appetite. Um, then I would say, that, again, look at low-hanging fruits. Things like sugary, sweetened beverages are things that you should be able to get, relatively easily get rid of. If they're caffeinated, it's going to be harder because caffeine is addicting. So you have to look at um, getting out of your caffeine addiction, and that may be so that may push it back. But you can always increase your fruit intake. Uh, you could always decide, you know, a half hour before dinner, I'm going to eat an apple and a half a pear um, and that study showed that just doing that will like you actually eat less so the first thing is I'd argue so a lot of times the first thing we take people want to do is take things from you you got to look at your situation sometimes it's better you add things add more fruits more vegetables in a whole form not fried in oils not you know not um, somehow sweetened with sugar through uh, soy sauce or sweet and sour sauce or barbecue sauce or whatever um, and add those in to take up more space on your plate um, and then 
over time, as you develop a taste for those things and begin to try and create um, new foods, it will display some of the old foods. Um, the other things that sometimes are low hanging food for people is to stop snacking. Sometimes just to say, all right, I'm gonna eat between seven in the morning and four o'clock in, in the afternoon. And then after that, I won't eat again. So those kinds of things. And we'll talk more specifically about this um, later on, um, in August 7th in our Taste of Freedom um, uh, uh, broadcast. Thank you. We'll go ahead and, and talk about the upcoming sessions. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have coming up, what we'll be doing is we're going to be having a slave food conversations, little small short panels that we're hoping to bring in different experts in the field in addition to Dr. Walsh and myself. We're starting off with Supersizing Urban America with uh, Dr. Ch uh, Chen Zhao that's coming in. We'll be having uh, guests as it relates to Sicker and Sooner. It's speaking to the disparities that occur, the stress equation, looking at how the role of stress and really the social issues, social justice, looking at food as chains and, and uh, that have happened, this history of food, this diaspora of evolution of food the way that it is right now in infiltrating our, our um, areas, communities too as well. The weaponization of food, looking behind the veil, peeling, peering behind the veil and looking at how these foods have been really crafted and shifted from recognizable things to things as, as, as uh, Dr. Walsh says oftentimes that it's so processed, even the bacteria don't want it, you know, in that particular instance is what we're looking at, right? And then we're gonna transition to breaking the chains of how we can break free of these disease through at the centerpiece, our nutrition, but added in by our activity, our mindset and the various aspects. And then Taste of Freedom, where I know already we've confirmed that none other than the Chef Babette will be joining us to kind of really make discussions about that. We also have another chef who's joining us earlier on in discussion. Um, Dr. Cin excuse me, uh, Chef C uh, Cynthia Chia Pin is joining us too as well. So we have a number of different people that we're looking forward to having join us in this discussion. You won't want to miss any of those. They're going to be exciting and um, incredibly um, 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 informational. So we look forward to having everybody back on those sessions. All right. It's good seeing you spending your Juneteenth with us, with us. Happy Juneteenth. And we look forward to seeing you. If you have not already, I want you to remember to, to log in and sign up for slavefood.org in which you can get notifications. I, you can also go to my uh, website, which is healthyheartdoc.org, or follow me on Instagram at, at healthyheartdoc, Twitter, I am Healthy Heart, or follow us back at um, Facebook uh, at Slave Food. All right. Those are the ways in which you can get in touch with us, but we look forward to seeing you the next time we come back next week, same place, same time. Thanks so much. <laughs>